On last week's show, we had Monty come on and tell us about two encounters he had, but unfortunately we ran out of time and I wasn't able to ask him any questions. So that's why he's come back tonight to answer those questions. Monty, before I start asking you questions about the two encounters you told us about on last week's show, for the people who missed that show, please give us the Cliff Notes version of what happened when you had those experiences. Okay. The uh, first encounter, I was 16. It was me, my brother, and a friend, John, and uh, we lived out in rural Virginia, Southwest Virginia, Giles County to be specific. Uh, Behind our house was some woods. We decided to go camping. We were up there. Uh, It was nighttime. I'd gone back to get some firewood, and I had something thrown by my head into the fire. And I paused a minute and I uh, had something else fly by my head and we realized it wasn't like an acorn or anything. It looked like a rock. And a couple seconds later, we had a about a, an eight to 10 second scream that scared the living daylights out of all three of us. And I basically grabbed my little brother and went straight down the mountain, uh, went through a fence, basically tore his leg up, got down to the to the house, uh, met John down there, which he took a, an alternate route, banged on the door, got inside. Um, after a little bit, my dad said, hey, let's go back up there and put the fire back out. I didn't want to go, but reluctantly, I went ahead and got in the truck. Uh, there was an access road that kind of paralleled my my way down. So we went up that access road, and while he got out of the truck and he put out the fire, I basically sat in the truck and <laughs> bit my fingernails and shivered, hoping that he wasn't going to get attacked, which he didn't. And he got back in the truck. We went back down, and... uh I basically, from then on out, uh, I had some trouble with some PTSD for quite a while after that. And that's the first encounter. The uh, second encounter was out in Manita, Virginia, a place called Snug Harbor. I went out to pick my brother up from a friend's house later one evening. Uh, I'm thinking it was around... 10 or 10 30 maybe 11 o'clock uh went out heard something on my way out really didn't think anything of it picked him up turned around came back and while i was reaching down to grab a cd or pack of cigarettes i can't remember what it was i was reaching down for but uh my brother started saying look 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 and i looked up and i seen the back half of this creature passing in front of us and we waited until it basically got about four or five steps into the woods there and then i gunned it back to the house went in my dad wasn't awake this time so we basically stayed up all night talking about it and that's pretty much both of the encounters did you see the thumbnail that i created for last week's episode by chance i think i did yes Good, I was hoping you had. How does the subject in that thumbnail compare to the one that you and Rob saw? It looks very, very similar. The top half of the torso was hunched over a whole lot more. It wasn't... The thumbnail that I'm looking at that you created, the subject is is standing up more of a... It has a better posture. This thing had terrible posture. Like it looked like it looked like it its back had been almost broken. Like it was just it, it like from the I would say from the um the shoulder blades to the head, like it was almost completely horizontal. Wow, I can understand why that did freak you out then. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. creepy. On last week's show, you said something I didn't understand, and I want to ask you about this before we actually dive into all these questions. You said that you live in the woods, but that you don't go into the woods now. Please clear that up for us. 
<laughs> okay, so <laughs> what I meant was I don't live in the woods anymore. I live in town. I, I must have misspoke on that one. But no, I, I live in a, a, a little small town called Dublin. I used to live in the woods. I think that's probably what I was trying to say, that uh, I used to live in the woods. I mean, we basically lived in the woods for my whole teenage life. But um, after that stuff happened with that, I mean, I, I haven't lived anywhere near the woods since then. The closest that I'd been is at my mom's house for a couple months. And that was, that's not really in the woods at all. That's, I mean, there's a few trees there and everything, but there's no real woods around. And the current place that I live in Dublin, it's, you know, it's a little bustling town, you know, it's, it's nowhere near that, the woods or anything, but yeah, sorry about that. (laughs) Oh, that's all right. Yeah, I figured you'd just misspoken, so just wanted to ask for clarity on that. Sure thing. Considering how John hadn't spent much time in the woods at all before he had that first encounter, did that experience hit him especially hard? Well, I only saw him a few more times. Uh, now, we, we saw each other in school, and we passed each other in school, but there, there wasn't a whole lot of conversation going on and uh when we started back uh that september and i don't know if this is related or not but he missed the first two weeks of school and that i mean you know back then uh we didn't have cell phones so we didn't have the internet well maybe maybe we had the internet but it was very very young and in its infancy and um our communication was you know pick up a phone and remember someone's number and you know speak to them on the phone and i wasn't much of a phone guy and plus i don't know it it affected me so much i i didn't want to drum up the the conversation with him to be honest with you i mean it was um it it was quite an experience for me but i just don't know We lost touch. I haven't spoken to him in years and years. So I really don't know how that affected him. Hopefully not too bad. It sounds like it was almost kind of awkward whenever you did see him after that encounter. It was. It it was very awkward. Um, He almost seemed to avoid me after that. Yeah, that's a pretty common thing when more than one person has an encounter. So it's not just you. If you've had a dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com. When those two rocks were thrown between you and your tent, do you think they'd actually been thrown at you or just past you? Uh, you know... I thought about that for a long time and uh, the only, the only answer that I can come up with that, uh, that makes sense to me is I think that they were just trying to maybe, maybe get my attention or, or, or say, Hey, this is our spot. You know, you you guys need to leave. Um, I felt like, with the after effects of like what happened, it wasn't a curiosity thing. And and I think if one of those things wanted to hit you with a rock, I think they would. As much as I know about them now, I think if they're going to throw something at you, you're going to get hit with it. Yeah, that makes two of us. I'm pretty sure they would hit you if they wanted to. You told us about the vocalization the three of you heard. Did you feel any nausea afterwards? You know, I felt it all the way down the mountain. Yes, I did. It was, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, actually. Um, you know, that's, that's something I, I didn't really remember until you just said that. That's, that's really weird. Um, but yeah, um, it, it wasn't so much during the scream. It was more, when I was going down the the mountain with Rob, like I mean, I I could definitely tell when like we we hit the dirt several times, and um, when I was getting back up, I noticed it. 
And um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That that's that's actually kind of kind of weird, man. I did I I don't know why I didn't mention that. I I guess I just didn't remember. It's a good thing with these uh with these encounters like this, you know, when you retell them, all these new details that you couldn't remember before comes up, you know. Oh, definitely. And yeah, don't feel bad about not recalling that because I mean, you're doing good to know your own name, so. No one could fault you for that. Were you holding it together pretty well until you looked over and saw the look on Rob and John's faces? Uh, well, there wasn't a whole lot of time in between the scream and the look on his face. But I think it was just a, I was more in a, uh, a fight or flight kind of mode at that point. And all I was thinking about was flight, holding it together. I don't, I don't know what anybody else would do. Well, probably anybody in my position would probably just freeze themselves. But, um, that's pretty much all that I felt was fight or flight. Um, as far as holding it together or not, I think it all collapsed when I came through the door. Uh, that's when I wasn't holding it together anymore. I, I was pretty cool and collective when it came to grabbing him and running down the mountain there. But as soon as I knew I was safe, like I, I was crying. I mean, I was hysterical. I mean, my dad had to calm us down for, I mean, we were all three hysterical, but he, I mean, yeah, I, I know it was a good 10 or 15 minutes that he, you know, was, trying to calm us down and finally he was just like okay you guys when you're done let me know and we'll we'll talk about this thing you know and that's pretty much how that happened <laughs> <laughs> you deserve a lot of credit i mean when it goes sideways the way it did that night you held it together and got business taken care of you grabbed rob and hauled him down that mountain and got him to safety as well as yourself and then after you were in relative safety once you were in the house, then you broke down. So you yeah. did what you needed to do. And like I said, you deserve a lot of credit for that. You said you drug Rob down the mountain that night as you're trying to get away from the creature. Why do you have to do that? Wasn't he trying to get away? Well, he was, but um, there was a significant difference between his body size and mine at that point. Um, I'd already hit a growth spurt. You know, I was 16 years old. I was... A running back on the football team. Rob was a little, I'll describe Rob back then. When he was 13, he was probably five foot tall and probably weighed 150 pounds, which puts him at a pretty hefty weight for his age. And, you know, I was lean and skinny and I'd played football for going on about eight years then and that was my my natural thing was running and i knew the instant that i had to grab him that he wasn't gonna be able to get down on his own like it, it just wasn't gonna happen like that thing would have had it and with with me helping him and and everything i i think it turned out you know the right way and poor guy was just you know he was just unfortunate. Now, later on in his life, he leaned out, you know, and he looked a lot like like I did. But those younger years for Rob, up until he was about 17, I'd say, maybe 16, he was short and pudgy, you know, and I was just worried about him. You know, I just didn't see him getting down there on his own. Well, like I said, you're a good man. Most people, they would have packed up and just taken off and the heck with anyone else with them, but. No, you stayed and did the best you could to get your little brother down that mountain into safety. So, yeah, you deserve a lot of credit for that. I saw an episode of Terror in the Woods. There was a bunch of kids that were running away from this Bigfoot, and there was an ice chest out front, like a like a freezer or whatever. And, like, this kid, his brothers locked him out of the mobile home, and he had to jump in that ice freezer. Like, I would have never done that to my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, when I watched yeah. that, I just couldn't believe that. Well, I could, but yeah, that's horrible. 
Yeah, and, and they kept him in that thing for a while, too. They did. Yeah, that's what he said. He said they did. Yeah, that was pretty bad, but when it goes sideways, you never know how you're going to respond. So, <laughs> And yeah, that reminds me of that. another eyewitness who I spoke with about his dogman encounter. He was out with his buddy one day. I forgot where, but this dogman jumps out and... He took off running and left his buddy, who was overweight, behind and said, oh. sorry, so-and-so, I forgot his name. But he just took off running. And next thing he knew, his buddy was blowing right by him <laughs> 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 and left him there. He was running still, but his buddy blew right <laughs> past him. <laughs> and oh, that's great. Yeah, you made it back to the house before he did, well before he did. I thought that was hilarious when I heard about oh, that. Oh, man, that is great. <laughs> but that serves him right. <laughs> yeah, it does. But then again, I mean, you can't be too hard on people. You never know. Like I said, how are you going to respond when things get sideways? Yeah, I, 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 I totally get that. No, but it's, it's definitely a funny situation there. I don't know if Rob would have done that, but, <laughs> you know, there was one situation. Uh, I was riding a motorcycle up on the dirt road uh, and there was down in the valley it was like a cornfield and we were almost racing and he it was about that time it was before that happened before the encounter happened but he was we were going from my grandmother's house which was actually like about a, a half mile away from our double wide and we were i was on the motorcycle just kind of put putting on the road and i looked down and i've i'd never seen my brother run that fast in my life and i don't i don't know why that just jogged that memory but that's kind of cool when you've got the proper motivation you can really pick them up and put them down yeah <laughs> yeah that's right how far was your camp from the house um now i've got my encounter on uh, my own uh, channel and if you go to that and you and you click on that video it says my own encounter it shows the google earth i, I kind of did like a little uh, it's like a measurement from the house to the top of the hill i think it was like a half mile quarter mile something like that i'll bet that felt like five yeah it did it did, especially going through those trees and and anticipating that uh, that fence coming up. I wasn't exactly going 100 percent speed. You know, there was times where I did hit 100 percent and, you know, I, but a lot of it was I was going slow for Rob and going slow because I didn't want to hit that fence. Oh, sure. Yeah. Between trying to drag him down the mountain and being worried about that barbed wire fence down at the bottom of it, then yeah, I'm sure you weren't yeah. going all that fast. Yeah. If it was just me, I would have beaten John down there by at least 30 seconds or so. I mean, that's my guess. John was a pretty fast guy. Well, I'm sure he was, but if you're running back, you must've had some pretty good speed yourself. Yeah, I was, I was okay back then. I wasn't bad. I believe it. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. Was it almost worse running away from the relative safety of the fire that night to get home, or were you glad to be doing that? Well, I'll tell you this. When we entered the woods and it started getting dark, like from the fire, you know, being uh, behind us or whatever, I, I thought I'd made a mistake because it 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 was pr it was pretty dark that night. I, I can't remember about the, you know, the moon phase that night or anything like that. But I do remember that it was really dark. And <laughs> I'll tell you what, I, I almost thought that I made a, a, a bad mistake. Well, I mean, you know, to this day, I kind of flip-flop. I almost kind of wish that I would have taken the road with John because, obviously, you know, it didn't get John, and that would have alleviated, you know, all of that, oh, crap, it's pitch black, you know, where do I go, you know, kind of feeling, and I wouldn't have hurt my brother, you know, scraping his knee up and... I mean, he had scratches everywhere, man. Like, it, it's a wonder I didn't put his eye out from a branch or something. 
please don't be too hard on yourself. You're put in a very difficult situation and you just handled it the best way you knew how. And I think you deserve a lot of credit for how you handled it. So don't be too hard on yourself. How long did you stay in that home after having that first experience? Well, let me think about that. We, let's see, we moved over there about the time I was 14 or 15. We were there uh, about a year or so when the encounter happened. And we didn't stay there much longer. We stayed there another year. And my grandmother passed away, so we moved up into her house, and we rented out the double wide. So that, I mean, we weren't like, we were still in the same overall location, but not in the exact location. I mean, like I said, it was probably like, I don't know, a quarter quarter to a half a mile up the road. And then we stayed there probably... I don't know, uh, another six months or so. I'm sure you couldn't wait to get out of it, though. Yeah, it it wasn't a great place at nighttime. During the day, um, you know, I I still didn't venture, but maybe a couple steps into the woods here and there. But I never went into the woods after that. Like, I, I was done at that point. But up at Grandma's house, the neighbors were a little bit closer and that that kind of gave me a a little bit of a, a feeling of uh, of safety i'm really not sure why but i guess with the, the more the people you know i guess my my mindset was the more people the least that those things want to come around being a kid Living right there in the woods, it really is a shame that you couldn't go out and just explore whenever you wanted to. Yeah, we we did we did it a lot beforehand, and even before that, uh, we lived close to the woods before we even moved into the double wide. So, like from a, a very young age, you know, that's what we did. That was our thing, you know. And it was about the time. Well, I'd started playing guitar around thirteen, so. After that encounter happened, I pretty much stayed in the house from then on out. And so did Rob, by the way. And uh, that's when my my interest in, uh, in playing guitar really ramped up. So that really served as a really good coping mechanism for me. That and, and art. Uh, I've been doing both of those since I can remember. Uh, I've got about 30 years of... A musicianship under my belt now so and well about 30 years of uh of art under my belt too so i i, I just wish i could have made some money with them <laughs> <laughs> no i understand your second encounter happened about four years after the first one had you come to terms yet with that first experience before that second encounter happened oh god no 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 uh I, I tell you what what happened. I pushed it back in in the back of my mind, and that's how where that that encounter lived. You know, I, I didn't bring it up. I didn't talk to Rob. I didn't talk to anybody about it after that. You know, uh, we I, we had a few conversations the first couple of weeks after you know it happened, but it kind of tapered off, and we just kind of knew. Like, just don't bring it up. And that kind of served as a as a good thing for me. Uh, I had some other things going on in my life anyway. I was in my younger 20s. Uh, well, I was 20. Um, I just met my now ex-wife, future mother of my, my kids. So I had a lot of things going on in my life at that point to kind of distract me from that. And then when, you know, we saw that thing <laughs> through the windshield, man things changed again and here i go again back into isolation heck i didn't hardly even come out of my room for a long time then i got married and we moved to the city and that was that for the woods (laughs) 
And even though that I lived in the woods, uh, I'll go ahead and clarify this real quick. Even though that I lived in the woods down in Snor Snug Harbor, I did not go into the woods. My path was door car, door car, car door. <laughs> you know, that's from the from the front door to the car. And I didn't I didn't venture out. I didn't want to venture out. I didn't want to see what was out there. And normally, I would go pretty quickly. Uh, even at nighttime, like when dad asked me to go pick him up that night, you know, I, I remember like, I did not want to go. <laughs> it was just a, it, it became a, a routine for me, like to just stay away from the woods, you know? I'll bet you did stay away from the woods. And that right there, that's what I thought you were talking about when you said that you lived in the woods, but you didn't go into the woods. I thought, okay. Here's a guy who actually has a home in the woods, but he goes, like you said, from door to car, and that's it. Yeah, that's it. I didn't. I mean, there was there there was some other times where we were out in the front yard, which uh, the front yard in Snug Harbor it faced the road. Like, okay, if you if you're looking from the front door, the driveway goes straight out from where you're standing uh, about, I don't know, uh, 80 feet maybe. And then there's like a, I want to say a cul-de-sac, but it really wasn't a cul-de-sac. It was just a dead end. Uh, but people did turn around there a lot. But once you get go that 80 feet out the driveway, you just turn right and it just went to the right at that point. But like um, the yard was pretty big. And every now and then me and my brother, you know, during the, during the daytime or me, my brother, and my dad would, uh, would go out and pass the football or if we had to work on the car, you know, but, but that's not in the woods. That was in our yard, you know, there's definitely a difference. How far were you from your new home when you and Rob had that second encounter? Well, when I went to go get him, it wasn't, but maybe three or 400 yards out the road from the house that I heard that cracking and stuff. But like when, when I went to get him and then come back, it was, there, there was a, there was a mile or two in between the house, like whatever that was. I, I don't know what that noise was uh, when I first went out. It could have been it or it could have been a deer. I, I, I really don't know, but my mind wants to connect the two incidents uh, for some reason. And, and if it was, if it was the same creature, we're looking at like it traveled a little ways there out towards the middle of the more forested area. So when I was coming back, it was probably a mile or two from the house. That's close. I'm sure that didn't help to calm your nerves after having that experience. It sure didn't, man. Me and my brother lived uh, on the upstairs part of this house, and we had a circular window. I don't know if you ever saw those, uh, like up in the attic, you know, kind of. We had like uh, like a loft kind of that we stayed up in. It was, uh, you know, you could see the the A-frame in our room. It was more of a loft room, and the um, we had two circular windows, uh, one near the stairs that you used to come up uh, that was on one in the back end of the house. And then on the front end of the house, it had another circular window. And that was where my bed was. It was right next to that window. And I'm telling you what, man, I had to, I had to get a sheet and, and put over that thing after that happened. I just did not want to look outside. I can understand why. Yeah, that's one thing when you have an encounter with a dog man miles and miles away from home, but if you're only one, two miles away, especially after having that first encounter that you and Rob had, yeah, that's totally understandable. And speaking of that, did seeing that dog man that night when you two had that second encounter almost push you or Rob over the edge? I, I don't know what I would define as the edge on that because I, it felt like I was already over it. When I started hearing those sounds, when I first went out to go get Rob, like I started thinking, 
you know, it was in the back of my mind, like, oh no, you know, because anytime I was e anywhere near the woods and I heard any kind of popping and cracking, like that, that feeling started coming over me again, you know, it was every single time, you know, and most of the time I wouldn't look, but the times that I did, you know, I would find that there was a squirrel or a, a deer or, you know, uh, somebody's cat or something trampling around in the leaves, but over the edge was probably <laughs> yeah i went i went yeah it was definitely over the edge i mean i i was basically hyperventilating you know the whole time home uh my brother had to really really calm me down like when we got home he was a lot more mature 4 years later and uh he really had to calm me down up there and uh, I, I just kept telling him, I, I, I don't want it to come in the house, you know. I, I don't want it to follow us, you know, back. And I didn't know what to do about that. Yeah, that's not a very good thought. It's not a thought that's going to give you the warm and fuzzies idea of a dogman coming into the house. No, definitely not. Not at all. How long did you say the claws were on the tips of its toes? Well, okay. The way that it looked to me was, okay, just imagine a normal toe, uh, say a human's toe, okay, not a canine toe. But because this thing had weirdly, I don't know, his feet, it, the feet on it was weird looking, man. I can't really say whether if it was canine or human. It, it, it looked to be like a... Uh, like a hybrid of like maybe both, but the toe, if you, if you imagine a, a toe and, and you look at it side profile. So, so you see the floor. Okay. And then the pad of your toes touching the floor uh, and then uh, several inches up, you know, you got the top of your toe. Normally, like on a human's toenail, like if it was to grow out, it grows out pretty straight and then it starts curling over. And that's, that's what it looked like. It looked like it, it had like kind of went out straight and then curled over at the edge. And then on the bottom of it, it was very flat. Like I, I don't know why that detail sticks out to me, but like I can see that toenail, like as I'm speaking about it. But I would say it was probably two inches long from the, the nail bed. Well, maybe two and a half. Uh, I'm looking at my finger here, and it was probably as long as my forefinger if I curl it at the end. That's what that nail looked like. So a couple inches. Sounds like they're pretty gnarly looking. They were. Yeah, they must have been. Could you see when you're looking at its feet if its claws were actually touching the ground? Well, kind of, I guess, yeah. When it raised its foot up is when I saw the claw. Like, that's when I noticed it, because, like, when the foot came up or whatever, um, it kind of came up, like, you know, like a, if you imagine someone stepping and then and then bringing their foot up, like I saw the edge of it, like it, it almost gleamed in the light. Yeah, that's, you know, that's about all I can say on that. Well, like I said earlier, you had so much going through your mind. No one can fault you for not knowing all these small details. Yeah, it was just a, it was kind of a split second, but like, I guess like where my eyes went from my brother's face horizontally from right to left, it kind of landed near his feet where his feet was. You know, that's the first thing I saw was the feet. How tall would you say it was? Oh man, this thing was... <sighs> This thing was tall, dude. Like, if he would have straightened out, um, the way the creature looked was it, okay, if you imagine, like, at the uh, shoulder blades, if you would just, like, if you saw the, the thumbnail, and we'll go back to that again, if you looked at the thumbnail on your, uh, 
on the video of the last uh, encounter there. The dog man in your picture is more um, standing up with a, a better posture than I would say that the one that I uh, that I had encountered. Um, it almost looked like from the shoulder blades or maybe a little bit below the shoulder blades, like it was hunched over, like it had this like hunchback kind of look to it. But if it was, I mean, that that position that he was in there, I would say he was at least six to six and a half feet tall. But if it would have raised up like and, and did like a correct posture, that thing would have been at least seven and a half feet tall. How wide would you say its head was? Well, the angle that I was at, I couldn't quite tell you how wide it was. Uh, now, I, I'll do a little, a little bit of speculating here. I would say it was at least twice as wide as a human's head. Maybe, maybe a little smaller. If that's the case, did its head look to be in proportion to the size of its body? It did. As far as, well, let me, let me actually rephrase that. It actually looked a little small because the, uh, the torso of this thing was absolutely humongous. Like it, it's hard to describe really, but, um, it almost had like a V shaped torso. But once you, once you get up, to the shoulders, you could tell this thing had a lot of girth to it. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, I, I just don't know. I don't know how to describe that. Oh, that's all right. If you're trying to describe a bear or a dog or something like that that you see all the time, that's one thing. But trying to yeah. describe something like this, especially when you're compromised the way you were, totally understandable. That you'd have a hard yeah, time. it was really just a shock. I mean, no, I think the the whole encounter may have lasted uh, five to six seconds, which I, it felt like a, an eternity. But in, in any time I go back and and, and relive it, you know, it, it just seems like it it was a longer and longer occurrence. But I, I try to keep a, a more logical mind about it and. Uh, take into account everything else that was going on. And, um, you know, it was probably five to seven, five to eight seconds long. And um, now, as far as, like, me seeing it, I only saw it for, like, maybe a second, a uh, second and a half. And then I saw a silhouette. I would say compared to a bear, I've seen several bears, a full-grown Black bear is what I'm used to seeing in this part of the country. I would say that this thing was much wider, much wider than a bear. I, I don't know if I was, I, I'd feel safe to say uh, uh, two bears wide, but maybe one and a half bears wide. I mean, this thing was huge. Its torso was huge. The arms were really lanky. Um, the waist was thin. The top of the legs where the thighs would be, uh, those things were, were ginormous. Oh, I'm sure they were. Were its ears on the sides of its head or more on top? Um, Kind of in between. If you were comparing it to a humanoid head, the ears were more, they were farther up on the head a little bit. Not much, but enough to where you could, you know, definitely tell it's, it was more in between. I wouldn't say on top of the head, but the ears seemed like they were super long. Like, and it may have just been the hair that was kind of sprouting out from its ears that made it look long. But um, they were very pointy. I definitely remember that from the left ear. I got a really good shot of that from the ear back to the back of its head. But that, yeah, that's, it was, it was probably, I would say six to eight inches long, maybe the ear, uh, maybe a little shorter. That's pretty long. Did it have them pinned or were they pointing straight up? 
They were in a pin position. They were uh, almost horizontal with the top of its head. Like it was, they were definitely laid back. Wasn't happy then. No, it probably wasn't. We probably surprised it. And that's, that's what my brother told me when we got back. He, he said, I guarantee you we surprised that thing. Like he was surprised. And I said, well, what did the look on its face look like? And he kept telling me that its hair covered the face. He couldn't really see. I'm still fuzzy on this. How close did you guys get to it at the closest point? Uh, I'd, I'd say it was about uh, 20 yards, 25 yards away. Maybe a little closer. I'm still doing my painted uh, rendition of my encounter. I'm looking at it right now. And I would say it was probably more like 25 feet. Yeah, because when I remember it going out of the light, it had a more defined way of moving out of the light, like like the light and the darkness uh, from my headlights. It seemed like there was more of a, a defined visual of him moving from the light to the darkness. Now, if you put something out in front of you, say, 30 yards, 40 yards or so, that definition of when it's in the light and when it's in the dark almost blurs a little bit. I just remember that it it was going into the darkness and like the front half of this thing, like I couldn't really see. And it was a very, I'd say, defined contrast. So the more I think about it, the closer I think that it was. But I, I would say... If I was a betting man, I would probably bet within 25 feet. You could see the individual hairs and all kinds of different little details and stuff, the wrinkles and stuff on its back. Um, it, it looked like it had a scar um, right up from its waist. Um, it looked like it maybe something had scratched it or it got in a fight with something. Like right near... near um, if you go up from its tailbone, up a, two or three inches, and then to the left, right around where your back turns into your side, it was a horizontal scar you could see. Uh, it was probably about four or five inches long. You could definitely see it, though, and it was fresh. The patches of hair on it was... It was very weirdly sparse, like uh, down near its waist, but like as it went up on its back, like it got thicker and thicker. That really does make you wonder what that scar came from. Might have been fighting another dog, man. You never know. Yeah, you never know. I, I don't know if those things are territorial. I'd say that they would be. But then if you look at canines, they're pack animals. So there you go. You know, you don't really know. And plus with the amount of information out there on these things like you know nobody really has one in their garage studying them so it's really hard to tell what these things behaviors are you know thank goodness no one has one in their garage that wouldn't go too well <laughs> no i don't think it would either not unless it was dead <laughs> even then yeah even then as it <laughs> yeah you're right yeah not a good situation did you ever go back to that spot to look for prints? Uh no, man. You know, anytime I got near that spot, I just I just rode right by it or I pushed the gas down to where I, I didn't have to look at it. Um I I was I was having so many problems with like nightmares and stuff by then. Like I I tried my best to just forget about it. That's how most people would have responded. Do you see a time coming, Monty, when you're going to be able to head back into the woods and actually have a good time out there? Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Like I said uh, on the last show, after we talked the first time, I, I wanted to push myself to, you know, to, to, to go into the woods and, and feel okay. And I, I got maybe 10 or 15 feet into it and... I was pretty scared, but uh, I didn't see anything. You know, it was it was daytime. Um, I didn't see any 
you know, any kind of dangers or anything around it. Um, it wasn't a hard spot to get out of. So like, you know, if something did happen, you know, I could get out of there really pretty quick. Um, but I want to be able to go in the future and, and be able to go on hikes and stuff. I mean, I used to go hiking and stuff all the time and I'm not much of a hunter. So, you know, getting out there and hunting really isn't my thing, but I am a fisherman and there, there's not, there's not a lot of places that you can go fishing where there's not woods close by. So, you know, that right there is that, that has really put a, a damper on my fishing. You know, I haven't, I haven't really fished anywhere near the woods for forever. Not being able to go into the woods again has put a damper on a lot of things that you would like to do, but baby steps, baby steps. Hope you take your time. Don't try to get back into the woods too quickly. Please do take your time, and I hope eventually you do get to the point where you can go back into the woods and enjoy yourself. Well, let's talk about your YouTube channel now, Monty. Please tell us more about okay. it. Okay. Well, my YouTube channel is called Unexplained Creature Encounters. I basically, in the future, want to mainstream it down to a little bit less of a wide variety of what I've got. Now, I've got several things on there. Uh, I've got a top three. I've got a top ten uh, cryptids that you have uh, you might not have ever heard of. I talk about uh, the Oakland creature of Nebraska, and I've got my, my own encounter on there, and it's got some visuals on there that'll help explain some of these things that happened to me on that first encounter, some visuals on there to you know, to really help with that. It, it's basically just about cryptids. Uh, I'm not uh, branching out too far off of that. And I've just started it uh, about seven months ago. And I've got, I think, six or seven videos. Yeah, I've got seven total. Like I said, uh, now, if if you listen to the first one, the top 10 cryptids you've never heard of, Please excuse the audio on that. That was the very first video that I've ever made. And I had the audio kind of jacked up a little bit, but the other videos uh, dialed it in and it's a lot more easier on the ears. But um, I appreciate you, uh, you mentioning that, Vic. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I listened to three of your shows last night in bed and I was impressed. Well, I wanted to mention real quick before we end uh, everything that if you've had a cryptid encounter, no matter where you are, how old you are, it doesn't matter. Email me at unexplainedcreatureencounters at gmail.com and email me with your encounter and I will feature your encounter on my show, on my channel. I'm looking for people out there that has had any kind of cryptid encounters, uh, Bigfoot, Dogman, any kind of weird experiences. I want to try to stay away from UFO encounters. I, I want to make a different channel for that. But uh, this is going to be based solely on cryptids. So if you've had a cryptid encounter out there, uh, let me know. Come to the channel, leave a comment, or email me. Please don't forget to subscribe as well. That's right. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Has recording shows about cryptids been helpful when it comes to you dealing with your own experiences with them? It actually has, especially me uh, putting my own encounter out there. Um, that one was the most reluctant <laughs> uh, video that, that I put out. I actually had that recorded for quite some time before I even released it. Um, that was the very very first video that I'd even scripted out. I mean, it was all scripted out, ready to go and everything just sitting there. And I decided to put out a, a top 10 to see, you know, how that went with the viewers and everything. And it, it actually went over very, very nicely. And then I put the uh, encounter, my encounter out there and all, all the comments and everything was very very kind and uh it it does it it kind of helps me um put everything to, into ex 
perspective and and it reminds me that i'm in here in front of a computer <laughs> i'm not out in the woods doing this uh not not quite yet anyway but um it, it is kind of a therapy that's really good news that's always a plus yeah oh and i wanted to mention real quick uh on one of the videos it's called top three rare cryptids you probably didn't know about if you look at the thumbnail now that's all my art i was the one who did that whole picture um there's a tassel worm on the thumbnail that is good art well it's about time for us to get out of here monty but before we do do you have any closing comments you'd like to share well i would just like to say thank you to all the people that commented on our last video there were so many comments that were very kind and thoughtful and i just wanted to say thank you to everybody out there that commented and, and i mean everybody uh, who watched that i wanted to thank you like i told you a lot of good people listen to the show and it's always appreciated how much they support the eyewitnesses so yeah it was pretty nice definitely i, I couldn't believe how many people had even commented on it it was it it, it, <laughs> it blew my mind to be honest with you <laughs> Well, yeah, you made an impression on him, and for good reason. Yeah, I just hope that anybody out there that has one of these encounters, they come forward. You know, the process of me meeting you and, and, and talking to you before the shows and talking in between the, the shows, you know, that was a nice thing that came along with this interview. I just wanted to thank you personally for that. You know, it, it, just, it really has helped me to process everything and get back to life as normal. I just wanted to give a personal thanks to you, Vic, and I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, you're welcome. Yeah, that's why I do this. Well, Monty, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing those experiences, and thanks again so much for your time. No problem. I enjoyed it. It's been a great time. Thanks again so much, and... Have a great night.